Hello everyone. Once again, this is Pastor Terry Reese of the Valley Grace Brethren Church of Armal, Pennsylvania. And as always, we deem it a great privilege to be with you for this precious time of study. We are advancing in our studies in the historic Grace Brethren Statement of Faith, that 12-point uh, traditional 12-point statement of faith, which uh, binds together a Grace Brethren people. And uh, we are beginning our studies in Article 4, on the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, preceding the classic 1969 12-point article of faith, uh, statement of faith, there was an earlier statement of faith that went back to 1921, which was entitled The Message of the Brethren Ministry. And that statement of faith uh, spoke uh, as to the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, it states that we understand the basic content of our doctrinal preaching to be, and it enumerates some things, and then it comes to point six, the personality and deity of the Holy Spirit, who indwells the Christian and is his comforter and guide. And as we look at the 1969 Statement of Faith, Article 4, uh, which is closely followed by the uh, Statement of Faith of the uh, Conservative Grace Brethren Group, um, with some additions, uh, we read here, Article 4, the Holy Spirit, we believe in the Holy Spirit, in his personality, deity, and his work in each believer. Baptism and indwelling at the moment of regeneration and filling to empower for Christian life and service. So that's a rather simple statement. Uh, as I observed, the uh, Conservative Grace Brethren Church uh, later expanded uh, upon that statement of faith, uh, leaving those uh, earlier propositions, but adding some additional material relating to the charisma. Uh, the controversies that we see today over the over issues raised by the charismatic movement, but um, we're beginning today. We uh, we just want to talk about the nature of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is sort of a, a general introductory message, uh, uh, shall we say, a two part into introductory message before we get deeper into uh, the various ministries that the Holy Spirit performs on our behalf. And as we'll find out, they are considerable. And we will be spending a considerable amount of time uh, on this subject. But let's think about uh, this whole matter of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he who is our creator, each person of the Holy Trinity is involved in our create in the creation of the universe. He is uh, our Redeemer. Each person of the Holy Trinity is involved in our redemption, our regeneration. That's why we baptize not only in the name of the Father and the Son, but also in the name of the Holy Spirit. He is, of course, perhaps most famously, our sanctifier, the one who makes us holy, who... Uh, progressively de uh, develops a Christ-like image within us. He is our great sustainer. He is the, our source of spiritual power, our source of spiritual service. We have no service without him. He is the one who, has, who gifts each believer, um, gives one a gift that we might be of service to the head. He is the source of our illumination. He is the source of resurrection power, that power through which we will be raised from the dead. And lastly, he is our God. I think it's quite essential, don't you, that we know something, a lot, perhaps more than just something, about the Holy Spirit. You know, at the... Uh, the Last Supper, our Lord Jesus' disciples were very distressed when he spoke of his imminent departure. I'm leaving. 
and uh, they were they were certainly sad, saddened to their hearts at hearing this news. But uh, he went on to tell them in John sixteen seven that his departure would be ultimately to their advantage. He said, "But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For for if I do not go away." The Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So, um, you know, as we, uh, we proceed with these studies, just to underline their ultimate importance, let us understand that the doctrine of the Spirit, what we call pneumat pneumatology, is absolutely central. To our faith. You know, when we think about some of the truths associated with pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, we, we find that these, uh, these things are, one, central to our understanding of the nature of God. We cannot understand the nature of God if we don't understand something about the Holy Trinity and the three persons of the Trinity. Two, the it is uh, understanding of these things is absolutely central to our understanding of the creation and sustenance of the physical universe. The Holy Spirit, uh, indeed, is involved in both. It isn't simply the Father and the Son who are involved in creation. Number three, pneumatology is central. Uh, the understandings that we learn from pneumatology are central to our understanding of the nature and dynamics behind human redemption, that is, behind our salvation. If we don't know something of the Holy Spirit and his work, uh, we will understand very little of the basic nature of salvation. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit is central to our understanding of the nature of sanctification, our being set apart and made holy unto God. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit is absolutely central to our understanding of the basic dynamics involved in the Christian life, that is, in our walk. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential also to our understanding of what we call of bibliology, what we call bibliology. Uh, where did we get the Bible from? The understanding of who the Holy Spirit is is central to all of these things. All these things are certainly, uh, um, shall we say, irreducibles of the Christian faith, things that cannot be broken down and you still have a recognizable Christianity. Uh, anyone who is orthodox, who uh, is to be deemed a brother in the Lord, must understand that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is God, that he is one of the three persons of the eternal trinity, that he is creator, sustainer, uh, and sustainer of the universe, that he is our sanctifier, that uh, it is in him that we are, are gifted and equipped for service, uh, it, he, that he permanently indwells the Christian, and that uh, he uh, indeed inspired the sacred writings that are the source of our authority. All these things are fundamental, basic, orthodox Christianity. And if a man uh, sets any of these things aside, uh, obviously, that, that would place him outside of the pale of historic Christianity. So there is much that what we would call Bible-believing, orthodox uh, Christians hold in common with regard to pneumatology, the doctrine of the Spirit. But there are also issues that legitimately born-again people disagree upon with with relevance to the Holy Spirit. There is much in this, uh, uh, in the doctrine of the Spirit that divides the Christian church today, not the least of which would be uh, the claims of contemporary movements like the holiness movement 
and the charismatic movements. Uh, both of these hold distinctive views of the ministry of the Spirit, which are controversial today. Um, issues dealing with uh, the question of uh, whether or not certain sign gifts are still normative in terms of the life of the Christian church. Uh, should we still be speaking in tongues? Should we still be performing miracles? These sorts of questions. And we're going to get into all these things. Again, there's so much here that uh, that's involved with this doctrine. Uh, so again, we'll be uh, on this for quite a while. But to today, we do, as part of the, our two introductory messages, we just want to talk about who is the Holy Spirit. We want to talk about his personality and deity. And uh, for time, uh, rest with regard to time restraints, we're only going to deal with his personality today. But, you know, when you deal with this whole question of his personality and his deity, this, uh, this was a matter of historical controversy, much like the doctrine of Christ. Now, uh, when we went through uh, uh, our studies in Article 3 of the Statement of Faith, which deals with the doctrine of Christ, I would remind you that in the early church, there were many controversies with regard to the nature of Christ. Who is Christ? controversies with regard to his deity, his humanity, how these two things interrelate, his personhood. And uh, these controversies are still with us, but they were particularly fierce in the early days of the church. It was something that the church fathers had to uh, study, and they studied these issues quite deeply, much more deeply, I might say, than the contemporary church. But uh, they... Uh, uh, they took the, uh, the seedbed of Christian theology that the apostles had left them, the inerrant, authoritative word of God, and it was to the next generation of Christians, the fathers, that the, re that the, uh, the responsibility fell to study the apostolic writings and uh, try to make sense of them. What is the Bible saying about the nature of God? What is the Bible saying about the nature of God? of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And the same is true here with the Holy Spirit. You may recall that when we talked about the doctrine of Christ, we said that in the fourth century in particular, there was a particularly powerful and pernicious heresy known as the Arian heresy. This was a movement which taught that Christ was a created lesser demigod that he was not fully God, that the Father created him. He was God-like. He was kind of like God, but he wasn't the eternal God, sort of a second banana God, if you will. And uh, this, uh, you know, when you adopt such a position, inevitably that also touches upon the Holy Spirit, there were uh, various heresies that rose in that same general era that uh, dealt with the uh, personhood and deity of the Holy Spirit. Um, the Arian movement obviously uh, overlapped with some of these heresies regarding to the, uh, with regard to the Holy Spirit. Um, some of those who were involved in the, the Arian heresy also got involved with some of the uh, um, pneumatological heresies, uh, denying the ultimate deity of the Holy Spirit, or perhaps even denying his personality, the idea that he is a personal, uh, that he is a personal, a personality. Um, the, uh, there were people called the semi-Arians who... Uh, begrudgingly accepted the deity of Christ, but uh, were binatarians, uh, refused to accept the deity of the Holy Spirit. Now these, uh, these heretics that questioned the full deity of the Holy Spirit, or even the personality of the Holy Spirit, um, they went by a variety of designations, the most famous being the pneumatamaki. Pneumatamaki. Uh, that's a Greek term that means 
fighters against the spirit. That doesn't sound good, does it? How many of you want to be known as fighters or combaters against the Holy Spirit? That's, that's just not good. Uh, but that's what the, uh, the Orthodox believers, the Trinitarians, uh, that's how they define these individuals correctly. Uh, sometimes they were called the Macedonians after a certain heretical bishop named Macedonius who uh, de-emphasized the Holy Spirit in those days. But uh, these, uh, these heretics, these pneumatomachi, were a loose assortment of uh, generally like-minded individuals who either who questioned either the deity and or the personality of the Holy Spirit. In other words, uh, some, while affirming that he was a person, denied that he was on the same level as the Father, or even on the same level as the Father and the Son. Some taught that the Holy Spirit was a created being, not the eternal God that he is not to be seen as being of the same homusia, of the same substance, the same essence as the Eternal Father or the Eternal Son. Some saw him as a created angel-like creature. There, uh, the, some of these uh, took uh, the, uh, the Council of Nicaea's uh, famous affirmation of the deity of Christ, and seeing that it didn't say a lot about the Holy Spirit, took that as a green light to debase the deity of the Holy Spirit. If you look at the original uh, statement of the Council of Nicaea, which beautifully defines the doctrine of Christ, that he is fully God, nonetheless, and I'm talking about the original version from 325, it, uh, nonetheless, with regard to the Holy Spirit, it, mean, it merely states... Uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and that's it. It doesn't define any further what we believe concerning the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when you leave things ill-defined or undefined, uh, that provides a hole through which a, a heretic can creep in, and that's, that's what happened. So there were those who believed, yes, that the Holy Spirit is a being, that he is a personality, but nonetheless, he's not on the same par as the Father or the, or the Son. Uh, he's, uh, he's not co-equal, he's not eternal, he's uh, an angel-like creature. Then there were others, uh, doubtless influenced by the Gnostic movement, that saw the Holy Spirit as a, an impersonal force, that is a non-person. Um, they simply saw the, uh, the Holy Spirit as uh, an active influence, uh, uh, an impersonal energy uh, emanating from God, a uh, diffusive energy emanating from the being of God. Um, some uh, some of the, Gnostic, uh, the Gnostics also saw Christ in that way that there is the absolute, and then there are the uh, lesser emanations coming from God. So, in other words, uh, some of these saw Christ. Uh, not only did they deny, deny the Holy Spirit as, uh, as being on the same level uh, as the, uh, the Father or the Son, but uh, some even denied that you're talking about a personality at all. Bible says the Holy Spirit, well, it's just talking about an impersonal force, you know, like gravity or electricity, something like that. Impersonal energy coming from God. Um, the first council of Constantinople, which was held in the year 381 by Orthodox believers, the, the Bible-believing Trinitarians of the day, um, wisely saw the need to beef up the original Nicene Creed, and so they added the following sentence to it. Uh, we thus refer to this as the niceno Constantinopolitan Creed, and it reads, concerning the Holy Spirit. These are beautiful words, by the way. Listen closely. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Isn't that a beautiful expression of orthodoxy? So the, the fathers made it very clear that they believe that the, the Holy Spirit is one, the Lord. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord. I love that phrase. The giver of life. Again, associating him with creation. Genesis 1 2, the Holy Spirit brooding or hovering over the waters, or over, over the primordial creation. The, uh, he is the one who energized the early creation. Uh, but um, it goes on to speak of him proceeding from the Father and, be, and in unity with the Father and the Son, and that he is worthy of worship and adoration. He, uh, he's God. Fully God, co-equal with the Father and the Son. Thus we worship him. Um, it's a beautiful statement of faith. One of the great historic affirmations of the Christian faith. And God's people believe those words even today. That they represent an accurate description of what the Bible teaches concerning the Holy Spirit. That he is a person. He's not a thing. He's not a force. Not energy. He is a personality. And he is God. Uh, that is nicely summed up in this ancient statement. But um, nonetheless, you know how things are. Error persists. As long as there are human beings uh, until, uh, uh, until that day in which uh, we are finally all glorified. Um, and uh, until that day at the end of the millennium when all unbelievers are discharged finally to the lake of fire. Um, error will continue. What does King Solomon say in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, that uh, mournful passage? That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there's nothing new under the sun. The same old heresies, sadly, remain with us. Still today, we see people uh, disassociating the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. You know, Mormonism, the largest American homegrown religion, uh, this, uh, this group um, sees the Holy Spirit as a separate being from Elohim, the main God over this world uh, in Mormon theology, and from Jesus Christ. Um, now, Mormon tritheism, it's not a Trinitarian religion, it is a tritheistic religion. They have three gods over this planet, but remember that's within an overall polytheistic structure. The Mormons actually believe that every planet has its own gods. There's potentially billions and billions of gods out there uh, in the cosmos. But um, the point being that... Um, the person of the Holy Spirit is differentiated. Uh, he's not of one substance with the Father, like historic Christian orthodoxy teaches, uh, the Father and the Son. Uh, um, the uh, biblical orthodoxy, of course, you remember our studies in the Trinity, that there is but one God, one divine essence, but nonetheless within the nature of that divine essence as a level of subsistence, there dwell three eternal collateral distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one in terms of their essence, but three in terms of their personhood. That the, uh, but you know, even this, this idea that this ancient idea that the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force, that continues today as well. The Watchtower teaches this. You'll ever notice their, uh, their statements. They always, rather than using capital letters, will say Holy Spirit, small h, small s. They will not use capital H or capital S, which would indicate personhood and deity. Uh, so... You know, when they speak of the Holy Spirit, they are speaking of an impersonal force which directs their or organization. It is God's energy um, guiding their 
organization. And so, you know, it used to be that when Jehovah's Witnesses baptized, part of their baptismal questioning, uh, their official questions, uh, made it clear that they were associating the Holy Spirit, impersonal, small h, small s, with the Spirit-directed organization. So, yes, they, uh, they, they baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but not in, the, not in the Holy Spirit in the sense that we understand as a personality. Um, but the Holy Spirit is a person. And in our remaining time, we just want to talk about those things. The, uh, you know, God is a person, of course. He identifies himself in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, as I am. That says many things, but one of the things it says is that he is a person. Um, but uh, we'll be dealing more with the deity of the Holy Spirit next time. But uh, we, uh, we're talking, we, we have to affirm that the Spirit is personal, that he's not some mere active influence. Uh, you know, the, the heretic Simon Magus, long before these 4th century heresies that we're talking about regarding the Spirit, uh, he, uh, he made that error, confusing the Holy Spirit with something impersonal. You remember in Acts chapter 8 when he saw the apostles uh, with the laying on of hands and the, uh, the Holy Spirit coming to the Samaritans, and evidently this was manifest through some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of sign, uh, uh, in the believer, and this impressed Simon Magus, and he wanted to give the apostles money so that he could, too could lay on hands and impart the Holy Spirit. It seems clear that he did not understand the idea that the Holy Spirit is a person, uh, that he sim simply saw it as some kind of uh, energy, and that he was going to purchase this power from the apostles. The apostles told him that uh, in no short terms that he was on his way to final damnation. He needed to repent. Um, the, uh, we, uh, we, also, uh, we also think about, you know, as I just mentioned, uh, this error continues today with the watchtower, which merely sees the Holy Spirit as a diffusion of energy, and uh, other groups the same way. Um, with regard to the personhood of the Holy Spirit, uh, how do we know that the Holy Spirit is a person? I just want to break down uh, some of these things. And uh, by the way, online I will be posting a written version of this, this teaching uh, so that you will uh, be able to study these uh, things in black and white and the various passages that we'll be going through. But um, first of all, we would note this. We, we see that the Holy Spirit is frequently assigned the common and universally recognizable attributes of personality. He is ascribed the attributes of personality, things that we can all recognize as things that distinguish a personal living, uh, a personal being, uh, that he is personal, not, a, not an it, but a he. Um, first of all, he is, number one, intelligent. Uh, intelligence is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. He has a mind, according to Romans 8, 27. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Friends, does an impersonal force have a mind? No. Uh, the, the law of gravity or electric or this thing we call electricity. They don't have minds, but the Holy Spirit has a mind. And uh, furthermore, this, uh, this mind demonstrates cognition. Uh, he knows things, as 1 Corinthians 2.11 tells us. So who knows a person's thoughts expect, except the spirit of the person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The spirit of God can comprehend things. And by the, by the way, that verse also speaks, also speaks of the Spirit's self-consciousness. Um, so, his, with regard to his intelligence, that's a demonstration that he is personal. He's a personality. Secondly, he has an emotional existence. 
You know, uh, a person can have an emotional existence, but an it can't. Uh, some sort of impersonal force or energy, that, that, that doesn't have an emotional existence, but the Holy Spirit does. Uh, he can be grieved, according to Ephesians 4.30. Paul advises us not to do that, not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Um, he can love, and also he can produce and inspire love, according to Romans 15.30. Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Notice, by the way, uh, just uh, maybe getting off subject a little bit, but notice how Paul values prayer, how much he covets, craves their prayers, because Paul knows that prayer works. Do we know that? That prayer works? It's something we need to be doing? Thirdly, the Holy Spirit has a purposive will, which he uses to direct believers. We see that in Acts 16.6. Uh, speaking of the apostles, it says, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Interesting. Uh, the Holy Spirit can forbid things. He can direct people. Energy sources, uh, that, that doesn't sound like an impersonal it, does it? Um, also, he, uh, in, in terms of his purpose of will, he directs, he, or excuse me, he distributes gifts unto men. Think about uh, that famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, that talks about our spiritual gifts, these gifts uh, through which we serve the head. Um, there Paul says, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Oh, so the Holy Spirit wills things. He distributes things in accordance with that will. Um, obviously, we're not talking about an impersonal force. Finally, fourthly, the Holy Spirit has life. Romans 8, 2. He's called the Spirit of life. So in all these things, he has ascribed recognizable attributes of personality. A second line of evidence with regard to his personhood is that he acts in accordance with these for aforementioned uh, characteristics or attributes. Um, he, uh, he speaks, for example, Acts 8.29, then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Of course, that deals with the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. So the Spirit said something to Philip. Friends, have you ever seen an impersonal force say something to anybody? When's the last time you saw the law of gravity, you know, the force of gravity, say something? Okay, it doesn't happen. It's impersonal. The Holy Spirit also performs miracles, as we see in Acts 8.39. He convicts us of sin, according to John 16.8. He intercedes for us, Romans 8.26. He issues commands, Acts 13.2. He teaches, 1 Corinthians 2, 13. He bears witness, John 15, 26. And then you have John 16, 13, that says that he will guide us in all truth. And in doing so, he employs the following enumerated activities, hearing, speaking, and disclosing. Friends, show me an impersonal force that does all that. Thirdly, a third line of evidence with regard to his personhood is that he is associate, uh, associated with um, the following personal characteristics that are totally inconsistent with the idea that the spirit can be is just a, an influence. Number one, he summons the apostle Peter unto obedience. That's Acts chapter 10, verses 19 through 21. Very forceful there. It deals with the story of Cornelius. Um, secondly, one can lie to him. You can't lie to an impersonal force, but um, Ananias in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, lied to the Holy Spirit. He lied to a person. 
And of course, uh, he was put to sleep for that because that person also happened to be God. Um, he, uh, you can resist him. Uh, Stephen condemned the Jews for resisting the will of the Holy Spirit, Acts 7.51, doing that all throughout their history, even now in light of the Messiah's appearing. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We already mentioned that, Acts 4.30, and he can be insulted, uh, Hebrews 10.29. He can be blasphemed, Matthew 12.31. Also, with regard to the Spirit's uh, personhood, uh, you have the, uh, the case of John 16, verses 13 and 14, uh, where we see the usual grammatical considerations uh, with regard to the word pneuma, or spirit, being set aside. Uh, that term pneuma, in the Greek, that's a Greek word, it means spirit, it's neuter. However, the usual uh, grammatical considerations are set aside because this spirit, this pneuma, this wind, this divine wind, is given mas a masculine pronoun, he, it's because this pneuma is a person, he. And uh, and even fifthly, we see that this person is one who has a relationship who relates unto other persons, whether they be divine persons or created persons. He relates to them as a distinctive personality himself. He relates to the Son as a distinctive personality. That's John 16, 14. Uh, there, uh, Jesus says, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. You know, uh, there's a re relationship aspect between him and Jesus. Acts 15, uh, 28 uh, speaks of his relating unto the apostles. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. That's the Jerusalem Council speaking to Gentile believers in terms of their instructions. The Holy Spirit and the apostles had a relationship. It seemed good to him and to us. And uh, we, uh, we also see, a sixthly, in terms of a line of evidence that points to his personhood, and this is our last one. I, I think we've given you enough, haven't we? Uh, but um, we see continually him being associated with the divine personalities of the Father and of the Son. In other words, the three are always being held up together, frequently. Uh, of course, the most famous expression of this is the baptismal formula, Matthew 28, 19, where we're called to immerse into the name of the Father and immerse into the name of the Son and immerse into the name of the Holy Spirit. And notice the three here are held side by side. They are, uh, they are held together. They are associated. Um, wouldn't it be odd if two of these were personalities, but the other one wasn't? Wouldn't that be a little bizarre? The Father. Baptized in the name of the Father, and into the name of the Son. Both of these personalities. Oh, and also into the name of this impersonal force. Weird. Just not, just absurd. Um, then, of course, you also have another example, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There again, you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, wouldn't it be a little odd if two of these were persons, personalities, legitimate personalities, undisputable personalities, the Father and the Son, and yet the third one wasn't? That, that, that just doesn't make sense. The sad thing, though, is that, you know, this, these things are spiritual. They are spiritually ascertained. It's not an intellectual problem as to why you have these heresies. It's not that the, the, uh, the ancient heretics, the uh, Numatamaki, or the modern heretics, the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not that they're intellectually dumb. They're not. It's, it's a spiritual problem. Natural man, man in his unregenerate total depravity, uh, cannot, cannot, cannot receive the things of God.
God himself must intervene. God the Holy Spirit must intervene and quicken our spiritually dead hearts that we might receive spiritual matters. That's why we that's why we also baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit because he is indeed essential to the believer's salvation, his coming into our lives, regenerating our dead hearts, applying the word of God which he himself gave unto the uh, the apostles and the prophets of old uh, so that we might receive these things and be born again to a new hope. The Holy Spirit does all these things and he is worthy of our careful attention through these studies. Let's just pray a moment that uh, the Lord would bless uh, this series. Our Father and our God, Lord, we begin another chapter in our studies in the Statement of Faith and this time we're looking at uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. We're studying uh, the various aspects of pneumatology, these things relating to the Holy Spirit. And we just pray, Lord, that this, this matter is so essential and so vital and so important, Lord, that you would guide us in accuracy and understanding unto your glory. Lord, I just pray that it uh, you would be glorified in this and also your people would be edified and Lord, that it would help to bring them further and further along in the path to maturity, which is your will for us. Lord, we would ask for these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, friends, again, we, we thank you for giving, extending the privilege for us once again to be with you for this time of study. Until next time, this is Pastor Terry Reese. May the Lord be with you.